thank you very much and uh, good evening everyone welcome to this uh, overview session on dot net maui so before i start i would like to thank the devopedia team for uh, providing me this opportunity to present the session today OK, so my introduction, I think it is already uh, over, so I'm going to skip this slide, but uh, just wanted to mention a disclaimer that whatever opinions and views I'm expressing in this session are solely my own and do not express the views or opinions of my employer. I have provided my LinkedIn and Twitter coordinates in case anyone is interested to uh, reach out to me for the areas of interest which are displayed there. Now, as we have an hour in hand to talk about this uh, vast topic, uh, what I will do is I will just narrow down the topic into these five uh, or six fundamental questions. So by the end of this session, you would have acquired a high level understanding of .NET MAUI and would be able to answer these uh, questions. Uh, so we will begin by from the basics like what is .NET MAUI? What is it or why is it useful for developers? What is the problem that it is trying to solve for us? Uh, who can use MAUI and what are the skills and system requirements for developing using MAUI? And uh, finally, we'll look at how to use it with some simple examples. Now, as this is an open session, I was expecting the participants to be a mixed group of both beginners and experienced developers. So I'll try to keep the code examples very simple so that anyone can easily follow. Now, to just to uh, start from the basics, uh, I'll just start with a brief introduction of .NET. So .NET is a free and open source developer platform, which is made up of tools, programming languages, and libraries for building many types of applications. Now note that I have just uh, highlighted the two words, such as free and open source. Uh, this was not the case earlier with .NET. So when Microsoft introduced .NET framework way back in 2002, it was proprietary and it was confined. It was closed source and confined to the Windows platform. But over the years, they have decided to uh, make it open source. And not only that, they have made uh, this completely free, which means there is no fee or licensing cost involved, including for commercial use. You have free tools that you can use. You, it, uh, I mean, and uh, they also provide a strong community of contributors from more than 3,000 or 4,000 companies, and there's a huge ecosystem of third-party component developers. Now, with .NET, you can build a variety of applications, ranging from web applications, web services, uh, which you can deploy in multiple server environments. You can deploy them on not only Windows Server, but also on Linux-based or Mac OS-based or even container environments today. You can build mobile apps, which is what we are going to talk about today, uh, how you can use a single code base and develop apps for Android, iPhone, as well as for other platforms like Windows and Mac. You can build desktop applications uh, using uh, .NET. You can build native desktop applications for Windows and Mac OS. You can build microservices. Uh, you can create them independently and you can deploy them independently to run on Docker containers, etc. Uh, for the cloud, you can use .NET for consuming existing cloud services, or you can also create and deploy your own services and you can build intelligent applications using vision algorithms, speech uh, processing, um, uh, text processing, predictive models and so on. So that's the entire uh, you know thing which comes under machine learning. You can build games, both 2D and 3D games using .NET for all sorts of devices, including desktop, mobiles and consoles. And finally, Internet of Things. Uh, you, you, I mean, .NET provides support for some of these hardware like Raspberry Pi and uh, other single board computers. Uh, so you, it supports a wide range of applications. Now, Microsoft has also provided tools like Visual Studio and programming languages like C Sharp, which provides productivity and performance. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why this is like very popular across the world. Uh, so that is about .NET. Now, .NET MAUI is basically 
uh, framework for which comes under the .NET platform or, or the .NET uh, uh, platform that we just discuss, uh, discussed. So this is a framework which comes under that platform. It's a multi-platform app UI, and that is a full form. So MAUI stands for multi-platform app UI. It is a framework for building native applications for iOS, Android, Mac OS, and Windows using .NET. So when I say .NET, here we are going to specifically use a particular language called C Sharp, and there is also another language about uh, which I will explain shortly. It's called XAML. Uh, the best part here is that you can build apps for all these devices using a single code base, which is which I'll explain in detail next. Now, all the platform APIs, when you say platform APIs, I'm referring to the APIs which you will need to use if you want to use uh, device features like storage, sensors, camera, uh, GPS, and so on. So when you want to interact with these hardware, uh, elements or hardware components in the device. Uh, each platform has its own APIs. So dotted MAUI provides you a unified API. You don't have to remember or you don't have to work with separate APIs for every device. So you have access to all, uh, you know, all the platform APIs directly from within uh, MAUI itself. Now coming to the user interface, we all know that not all these devices have the same user interface specific, uh, you know, the, the styles which are used for the user interface design is completely different. The screens that you see in iOS will not be the same in Android. Likewise, what you see on a mobile will not be the same on a Windows tablet or on an iPad or maybe on a Mac. So the user interfaces are different for each of these platforms. But Maui, .NET Maui abstracts all these complexities for you. You just have to define the user interface using the components provided in .NET MAUI. So if you say I want to have a button, that button will be rendered in the respective device in its native look. So on Android, it will look like an Android button and on iOS, it will look at like an iOS button and so on. So that is entirely abstracted for you. You don't have to worry about how that is going to look. So all you have to do is use the platform, uh, use the APIs and use the elements which are provided uh, as part of .NET MAUI. And for this, we use a language called XAML. Uh, it is mentioned, it is written as XAML, but the pronunciation is uh, XAML, like it rhymes as in Camel. And uh, it stands for Extensible Application Markup Language. I will be explaining it a little bit in detail in the subsequent slides. So that is how you develop the user interface. And it is open source, and uh, for those who are familiar uh, with the Xamarin, because that is one of the popular articles on uh, Devopedia as well, which uh, uh, Arvind and I have put it together. So if somebody has already worked on Xamarin and uh, wants to know how it is related, so .NET MAUI is the next generation of Xamarin. It's a evolution of Xamarin forms. So that is about .NET MAUI in brief. So we have just answered the question as to what is .NET MAUI. Now let us look at why this platform and what problem it solves for us. Now, if you are developing any application today, whether it is for business or uh, you know it, it's an application that you're developing for fun, you can't develop for one platform today. You have users scattered or spread across all these platforms. Uh, worldwide, if you look at it, Android, as majority uh, users, but if you look at specifically North America or US, maybe iPhone users might be more. So you cannot just build for one platform. You will have to develop for multiple platforms. Now, if you're developing for multiple platforms, the challenges here are that each platform has a separate technology stack. iOS requires you to develop applications using Objective-C or SWIFT, and the tool that you will use is Xcode. For Android, you have to develop it using Java or Kotlin, and the tool will be Android Studio. And for Windows, you will use either C Sharp or VB.NET, depending on the framework that you're using, and you will use a tool as Visual Studio. So since all these three tools and languages are completely different, you will not have any kind of code sharing between them. For each platform, you will have to create this application from scratch. You will have since you have multiple languages and development environments, 
most probably you may not have the skills within one single team or you personally may not have all the skills to develop for all the platforms, which means you will need to have multiple teams, uh, which adds to the uh, you know investment cost. So the complexities here are too many, like you have uh, no code sharing, you have multiple teams, uh, multiple code bases, the whole process becomes very expensive and slow. If, if you are to develop for all these three platforms, you can understand how uh, how much time it's going to take. So if you want your product to be uh, to have a very short TTM or time to market, then you need to look at an alternative. You cannot go with the silo approach. The positive approaches the, or the pros of this approach is that you can create great application experiences native apps when you've developed them using the recommended technology stack they they the performance wise it is really good provided you develop it properly so it provides a great user experience no doubt but the the cons are too many here development is hampered by multiple code bases and fragmentation and so on so there were a number of solutions developed over a period of time by different vendors which allowed you to write once and run anywhere. So these were primarily, uh, you can call them as app generators. There are a number of them, so I've not listed all of them here. So you could develop applications using Lua, JavaScript, ActionScript, or even um, TypeScript, which is also an advanced version of JavaScript, a superset of JavaScript, you could say that. And then you have HTML and CSS. So these are basically, uh, like for example, for Lua, uh, there is a framework called Corona. You can develop the application in Lua and uh, that compiles that into a code for all these different uh, devices. Uh, if, if you are looking at JavaScript, again, you have multiple frameworks. You have uh, uh, Cordova, which is very popular at one point of time. It is also called as PhoneGap. Then you had Titanium and uh, you had something called IBM Worklight from IBM. So these were all hybrid uh, solutions where you will write the entire code using HTML, CSS and JavaScript. And what ex what it is actually what happens is your app is going to or this is basically a web page what you create or a, web, uh, a simple web application that you create. It will run inside a browser. Which is your app, so the app basically contains a browser and your code is going to run inside it. So obviously its performance is going to be dependent on the browser, so you will not get that superior performance. Uh, action script is another option uh, which is uh, uh, which is also not very popular and then you could develop applications using simple html css and uh, package that using jquery mobile or a css library like bootstrap or foundation and you could develop an application or a web page which looks like a mobile app but these are all like uh, quick fixes the there is a lot of limitations when you develop with this approach you have limited a native API access. You cannot access all the device APIs using this uh, approach. The performance is a little slow. Uh, it all, as I said, it uh, it is going to execute inside a browser. So, uh, especially if you have long lists and if you have too many images, animations, etc., then your application will be providing a very poor performance and the poor user experience. So net result is that you will have unhappy users. Developers are also unhappy and uh, there is an increase in abandoned apps and uh, there's a big limitation in what you can do here. Now a few companies decided to take a different approach. So these are the leaders who uh, market leaders who actually came out with frameworks which allows you to develop native applications uh, using this right ones run anywhere approach. So this is what we call cross platform native development. So Flutter was introduced by Google, uh, which allows you to create native applications for iOS and Android using Dart. So that is one disadvantage that a developer will have to learn a new language called Dart. React Native is actually uh, created originally from uh, by Facebook. They, they introduced React first uh, for web websites. Uh, Facebook is built on React and uh, then they introduce React Native, which allows you to build native applications for iOS and Android. So initially they developed it only for iOS and Android, but then it depends on the community support for 
running on or to develop applications for Windows and Mac. So Microsoft has developed the uh, React Native Windows uh, port of React Native uh, for Windows. So here you would develop the application using JavaScript or, or TypeScript even. Uh, so you will use the latest version of JavaScript called ECMAScript 6. Native script is another uh, framework which it, which is introduced by a company called Telerik, which was uh, primarily a third party component development uh, company which used to provide user, uh, you know, a lot of controls and, uh, uh, you know, developer tools. Uh, so they developed this framework called native script, which uses a model similar to Angular. So somebody who is already familiar with Angular and TypeScript can easily develop a cross-platform application using native script. Uh, Microsoft uh, earlier had a platform called Xamarin, uh, which addresses this problem. And .NET MAUI, as I already mentioned, is an evolution of Xamarin form. So I'm not going to talk about Xamarin here. So we can now conclude here that .NET MAUI is the latest answer from Microsoft to Google's Flutter and Facebook's React Native, etc. Now, the advantage of .NET MAUI is that anybody who is actually working on the backend technologies or who has been working on C type languages, whether it is Java or C++, C, C Sharp, any of these languages, need not have to learn something new. They can just bring in that skill here and develop the application. And it's a very easy to learn language. It's not very difficult. It's a very powerful language, but one need not learn everything. So as uh, you know, you, you start working on very advanced applications, probably you will have to explore all the other features, but otherwise C Sharp is something which anybody can learn quickly. Uh, so with a single skill, you can actually build both the backend as well as front end when it comes to dot technology. That is the biggest advantage. Now, this diagram shows a high level view of the architecture of a .NET MAUI app. Now, .NET MAUI app. Yeah, use. Pointer, OK, so the .NET MAUI unifies all the uh, APIs of other platforms like Android, iOS, Mac, Windows, etc. It unifies all that API into a single uh, layer as shown here. So this is what allows developers to write once and run anywhere. Now, additionally, developers can also access the APIs of the individual platforms. I'll just explain that in a second. Now, below that you can see there is a .NET 6 layer. So this provides a series of platform specific frameworks for creating apps. Like you have a .NET for Android, you have a .NET for iOS, .NET for Mac, and uh, something called Win UI or it is uh, or Windows UI. So this is used for Windows. Now these frameworks all have access to the same .NET base class library. BCL stands for the base class library. So this basically is like a set of pre-built code which you can readily use in an application. So you don't have to write from scratch. So you want to do something like you want to send an email. There are classes which are already created for you as part of this library. You just need to create an instance of the class that object you have to use and call its methods, your job is done. So like that, it's a huge library which is already made available for you. And uh, this library abstracts the details of all the underlying platform uh, you know, implementations. So you don't have to worry about how it is going to interact further with the respective platforms. Now this base class library depends on a .NET runtime to provide that execution environment. So .NET uh, the way .NET works is all these base class libraries. Basically, this is code. Now, when it needs to execute, it needs a runtime environment. This is similar to uh, Java Virtual Machine, uh, which you may be familiar with. So, the, the there is a runtime which is required, and uh, on Android, iOS, and Mac, you can see that there is an implementation called Mono Runtime. So, it is going to depend on this particular runtime for Android, iOS, and Mac. Whereas for Win, Win UI, it is going to be called as .NET Core CLR. So this is going to provide the execution environment for the uh, code. Now, this base class library is what enables the apps running on different platforms to share that common business logic. So if you're developing an application, that business logic is shared across as long as you are using the base class library provided here, 
uh, it will be uh, applicable to all the platforms. And in case you want to do anything platform specific, that is also possible. You can, as I said, you can use the .NET for Android or iOS or Mac or WinUI functionality. But in that case, uh, you will have to maintain a code base for each, a separate code base for each of the individual family of devices. Now, how it works under the hood is like shown here. So what that number one indicates is that the developers will be writing code, which primarily interacts with the .NET MAUI layer. And .NET MAUI layer in turn consumes the native platform APIs as shown in number three. But in, you know, optionally, the app developer can also directly call the platform specific APIs like what is shown in number two. You can, I mean, developers can also uh, directly access the second layer that is for individual platforms. Now the question might be like, which platforms are supported when we're saying all these devices, right? It's a very big list out there. So Microsoft has designed this in such a way that uh, these are the platforms uh, that you can target. So Android 5.0 or API 21 or higher, iOS 10 or higher, and Mac OS it's 10.15 or higher, which uses Mac Catalyst. Now Mac Catalyst is basically a framework introduced by Apple, which allows you to port iOS applications, which you develop for tablets or uh, for iPad or for iPhone. You can actually run it on a Mac as well. So Mac, generally, if you want to develop an app uh, directly for the Mac, you will use a different framework called AppKit. Whereas for iOS and Android, uh, for iOS and iPad, we use something called a UI Kit. So this allows you to port an application which is built for UI Kit to run on a Mac. And then you have uh, support for Windows 11 as well as for Windows 10 version 18.9 or higher. Now, what you will need for developing my .NET MIUI applications. So .NET MIUI applications you can build using either PC or a Mac and you can compile that into any of the native formats. Now, PC, as, I, uh, as we can see, it is either Windows 10 or 11 that you have to use. Visual Studio 2022 version 17.3 and above will be required because that is what is going to come with full MAUI support. And it is, and there are multiple editions available. There is a community edition which is available free of cost. Anybody can download it from Microsoft website and they can start using it. Only thing is Visual Studio, since it's a very, uh, uh, complex ID with which power, uh, you know, or I would say like it, it can be used for it's a very versatile ID. It can be used for multiple types of applications. So to reduce the size of the download, Microsoft has packaged all these uh, different uh, tools under workloads. So you have to install the .NET MAUI workload after you install Visual Studio 2022. So the steps are very straightforward. It is given in the start guide. I will give you the link at the end of the session. So with screenshots, it is given guidance is given there. So uh, it's a pretty straightforward process. There is nothing uh, you know complicated about it. Uh, it is also recommended to have virtualization support in your machine because you will be running emulators for Android and Windows, etc. So having virtualization support makes your application run faster. But uh, uh, from my experience, I will I have also provided a note below that while this can be developed directly on the emulators, the second point that I have put on the footnotes, the emulators are good for development, but real devices are recommended for testing because it's quite fast. In fact, I have connected my Android phone also just to show you how it works. So here you can see the. Uh, so this is my Android phone, which is currently connected to uh, the system and uh, I'm able to run the Maui application directly on my phone. So I didn't have to deploy to the Play Store or something like that. I have just uh, directly uh, connected to my Visual Studio and from Visual Studio, I have been able to uh, load on this particular mobile. So it's quite easy to do that. Now for Mac, you need to have one of these uh, OS. And uh, second thing is whenever you're developing for any of the iOS devices, Please refer the first point of the footnotes. While you can build apps for Android, iOS, and Windows uh, using Visual Studio on Windows, but Apple's legal requirement is that uh, 
you have to use a Mac when you are building an iOS app. So that's a kind of a legal requirement uh, for licensing term of usage for Mac, uh, you know, uh, for Xcode that it has to be built using Mac. So you'll need to have a network Mac uh, connected to in the same network uh, with which you can actually build for iOS. And uh, if you want to publish your apps, then you will obviously need the developer accounts as well. So the last information that I know is that Android, it is only like uh, one time that you have to pay for uh, the Play Store account. It's a developer account. It's about $25. Uh, it used to be around $25. I'm not sure if it's changed now. But for iOS, it is a recurring fee. You will have to pay annually. Now, what about the skills that you require to develop applications? So as I mentioned earlier, that most of the time you will be using C Sharp to develop the application. And for the user interface, you will use something called XAML, which is something which you can learn in the matter of uh, hours. And uh, since you will be developing for mobile, it is also good to have an understanding of mobile user experience design. There are a lot of references available online to show you what are the different kind of screens that you can use, uh, what are the different navigation and uh, tab uh, pages formats that you can actually uh, use in your application. So these are all available online. Uh, now, if your app is a very trivial app and uh, it's a standalone app like a calculator or a notepad or uh, something like a game or something like that, probably you may not have a back end even. You can directly develop everything using C Sharp and XAML. And you, uh, just like I showed a demo app running on my uh, mobile, this app can be standalone. But if you're developing a business app or an enterprise app, probably you will have a back end as well. So the back end you can develop in any technology. Uh, but if you are developing using the .NET stack, then you should know how to work with the, uh, you know, either the Windows or, or the server environment or uh, cloud environment. You should be familiar with hosting the web API there. You should know how to create a REST API and uh, in interact with the database. So you should know a little bit of database design and development. And uh, if if uh, you you want to bring in some functionality on the server, then that is additional knowledge that you should be having. Now, <clears throat> let's look at how you can get started with .NET MAUI. So once you install Visual Studio with all the tools that I just mentioned, so this is Visual Studio and uh, you have an option to create a new project. And as you can see here, there are like there's a long list of projects that you can actually uh, build from. So you have all different platforms, all different languages and uh, different types of applications that you can develop here. So I just wanted to show you this uh, for a glance, but if you select Maui, then the templates for the Maui apps will be displayed. All you need to do is select the .NET Maui app template. There are other templates also for Blazor and class library, which I'm not going to cover today, and you just have to click on next. Provide a name for the application. So let me call this as Maui demo. And this will create a solution in my local folder. I can change the path. And I just need to create it. So it just takes a, about a minute to create the project. So while it is creating, so when you're doing it for the first time, especially when you're trying to debug your application, when you're trying to run the application in one of the emulators, you will have to do a little bit of additional installations because you will have to install the Android SDK. Everything is again straightforward. Even I did not find any uh, difficulty while doing that. So it's a pretty straightforward process. You will not have much of uh, problems in doing those steps. So once you're project is being created. So this is like a boilerplate code which allows you to start working on .NET MAUI. In fact, this is a ready-made application. In fact, you can even directly run it. So what I'll do is just to show you how it will work. Let me just uh, show you how you can debug. So there is some code over here, which I'll explain in a minute. But uh, as you can see here, you have different kinds of devices on which you can run this application when you want to debug it. So you have like uh, the Windows machine itself, so the, that which, which means that if I run this application with this option selected, it is now going to create an emulator of this Windows machine itself and it is going to run that. Or I can choose one of the other formats as well. So I have already installed an Android emulator. 
which I can use or I can go with iOS local devices, iOS emulators, etc. So I'm going to choose the Android emulator so that you can see how it's going to work. So if I choose this Android emulator and run this application, we should be able to see the default application what is shown here. So there is a certain message which says hello world. So I'm just going to change this to Devopedia so that we can see the changes there. So I just need to save the change and click on this play button now and it will take some time to build this code. It will create the native code for Android. And then it is going to run it in the emulator. And while that happens, I'll let me keep the emulator open. So this is the Android emulator which is running on my computer. So this app is now going to be running inside this emulator soon. Now, while this happens, let me also briefly talk about the project structure. So on the right hand side, you can see the there are a few files here. OK, so the Maui program dot CS that you can see here. This is a C sharp file dot CS extension stand for C sharp and you can see that. This is basically a class, so anybody who knows object oriented programming will understand that we have classes and classes will have methods and properties. Now there is a namespace here which is just to provide some separation of code so that it doesn't conflict. The same name of the class doesn't conflict with another uh, application of the, with the same class name. So this is a way of code separation. Uh, and within this class you have a method which is going to return to you an instance of a Maui app. So basically this Maui program.cs is the entry point of the application. It contains the code for creating and configuring the application object as well. Now, how do you configure it? As you can see here, the, it uses a builder pattern. Uh, if you're familiar with design patterns, uh, using the create builder method is going to create a builder for us. And uh, when you configure it using all these different methods which are available, you can say that uh, for this particular app, we are going to add these fonts. Uh, anything else that you want to add or configure this app, you can do all that over here. Now, the second file that is important here is app.xaml, and you can see that it has got a companion file, which is a C-sharp file. So every XAML file will also have a C-sharp file. Now, this provides all the UI resources. So if I double click on that, you can see that it contains some resources which are pointing to colors and styles, etc. So whatever styles that you're going to use in your app or the colors that you will be using in your app, or any of any of these, uh, you know, we can call them as resources. You can actually define them in a separate place. So here you can see resources. There is a. OK, I think it has started running now, so let's switch to the emulator and there you can see the app is loaded. So very soon we should be able to see our welcome message. Yes. So that's our welcome message. Hello, Devopedia, that we can see here. And there's a button here which I click. When I click on it, there is some interaction also happening. You can see that each time I click, it says uh, we clicked uh, so many number of times. Okay. So that's just to show the boilerplate code or the default code which came with this particular app. I can stop debugging now, going here and say stop debugging. So let's complete this um, project structure. So the app.xaml is providing the UI resources that are required. So the resources are defined inside different files. So all your images, fonts, styles, everything will be. There are specific folders meant for that. We'll have to place it there. So this style, if you can see, is uh, mentioned over here. If I double click that, you can see that it is defining all the different uh, font sizes and colors that you want to actually use for your app. Now, the app shell.xaml, there is a different file called app shell.xaml. So, this is basically the initial page for the application, which handles the uh, uh, you know, registration of pages required for navigation, etc. So, here you have a uh, placeholder which says display this particular content to me. That is a main page. Main page is also already provided as part of the application. We can open it, and this is your layout and UI logic for your initial window. 
the, and here you can see that there are some components which I'll explain in a second. So this is where we have actually modified the code and which was actually getting rendered on the UI when we ran, when we uh, display that in the emulator. Now, having discussed the project structure, let us understand the app anatomy as well. So I'm going to switch back to the presentation. So we already discussed the project structure. Now coming to the app anatomy, like when you, whenever you see an app like this with some text and it's a button, this text is actually provided by a certain control called label and the click, the, the button is actually another control as you will understand. So now this is actually arranged in a certain way and that is actually like this. So you can see multiple layers behind this particular UI layer that we are seeing. And in this case, you will have a shell at the back end. Uh, the shell will be the parent component here. The shell will display a content view. A content view will in turn display a stack layout and the stack layout organizes all the elements. In this case, it is vertically stacked. You, you have a vertical stack layout as well as horizontal stack layouts. And there are other kinds of layout as well, which we'll discuss. So this is how an app typically looks like. So there, this is a set of components that you arrange in a kind of a hierarchical format. And that is exactly what XAML allows you to do. So now let's talk about XAML. Now, XAML stands for Extensible Application Markup Language. That's a full form. And as I already mentioned, it's pronounced as XAML. And it has a code behind file for implementing methods and events. Now, so XAML is basically meant for representing the UI. Now, there are, there are a little bit of functionalities that you can write directly in XAML, but not everything. Like XAML does not provide you the option to write methods or uh, you know write your even handling methods etc when you click on a button what should happen when you uh, you know click on a drop down box what should be displayed so it it needs uh, some c sharp uh, functionality as well and that is why you have a code behind file for implementing all the methods and events now the rules for xaml are almost similar to xml uh, which you might be familiar with uh, that's the same uh, you know format that we actually even use for html it's just a markup language and uh, there are some specific features like markup extensions and binding syntax which are unique to XAML. I'll show you one example which will uh, show an exa you know, implementation of markup extensions and binding syntax. Now, a few essential XAML concepts that uh, you, you know, any, when you're starting to work with uh, XAML, these are some essential concepts that you need to know. Uh, you have concepts of property elements and attached properties, content properties, markup extensions, data binding, control templates, and data templates. So if you're familiar with these uh, seven items or the seven areas, you will be comfortably able to build user interfaces. And this will not take much time. In a day or two, you can actually, anybody can learn this easily. So I'll just, uh, I'll not be uh, focusing on all the different uh, uh, features here, but I'll just take some examples here for a quick demo. So why XAML? Now, suppose if I decide to create a user interface in C Sharp, like the one that we just saw a while back, this one. So you have a shell, and inside the shell, you have a content view, and then you have a stack layout, and then you have this label and the button. Now, if I want to create this in C Sharp, the code would be something like this. I would be creating a scroll view, and I'm going to say that the parent, that is the shell, should display that uh, content, which is a scroll view. And all the other comments, I'll have to initiate them clear. I mean, I have to create them one by one. So I'll have to say a background. I need a background. Now, background is also an object. In object oriented programming, everything is an object. So, background, if you have a color, that is also an object. So, the background has to be created as an object using solid color brush class. And you'll have to specify the color also like this. Margins also, you need to create a thickness object and you need to specify for all the four sides what is the thickness that you want. And then you will have to create an object for the vertical stack layout and then say the vertical stack layout's content should be this particular scroll, uh, the stack layout that we just created. So we are going to have a scroll view and the scroll view content we are going to say is this particular stack layout. And the whole scroll view has to be the content of this main page. So you can see that if you have to develop a complex user interface, this approach is going to take a lot of time because there's a lot of code involved. You can see the same equivalent in XAML. It's very, very easy. All you have to do is take the content page. I'll explain this parts in a second. 
but uh, just look at the elements here. You are just taking a content page and saying that the content page should contain a scroll view. Scroll view should contain a vertical stack layout, and that's it. And inside the stack layout, you just need to put the same thing like uh, you have a label and you have a button, etc. You just have to put them. So this nesting of components makes it easier to not only develop but also troubleshoot or modify later. It becomes very easy to maintain your markup. Now, because this form of, uh, follows XML syntax, you have the ability to provide attributes as well. So whenever you want to define values for this content page, like for in, in this case, we defined, uh, uh, you know, the, the scroll view will have a margin of 10, 10 on all sides. I can actually use this approach here and simply say a margin is equal to 10 comma 20. And if I want to specify for all the four sides, I can simply say 10 comma 10 comma 10 comma 10. That's it. So using these attributes, it's much easier to actually configure the individual elements without having to write such complicated uh, lines of code. Likewise, for background, you don't have to worry about creating a new solid color brush and then applying these colors using the standard colors available, etc. All you have to do is say background is equal to dark slate dark slate gray. So you can see that uh, XAML syntax is much more easier when you want to develop a user interface. And uh, when you are uh, creating a XAML file, all these things are automatically populated for you. There is an XML uh, encoding and uh, version uh, directive which is on the top. And then you have a couple of namespaces. These are all identifiers. They are not actual uh, URLs or uh, physical locations. So these are just to indicate what is the uh, what are the types that we will be actually using in this particular uh, markup file? So you have uh, XML namespace, which is like an URI. Likewise, you have an, another namespace, and for this we are providing an alias called X, which is actually used in some cases like X colon class and so on. So as you can see, XAML makes the developer more productive without having to write code in a very laborious way, but Having said that, if somebody still prefers to write code in C Sharp, they can perfectly do it. The application will work without any issues. Now, the root content can be different kinds of pages. You can have a content page, or you can have a navigation page. So if you're using a navigation page, you will be able to navigate from one page to another and go backwards. So for that, you have separate, uh, you know, uh, different class called a navigation page. In the interest of time, I'm not going to actually run the code for you. So we are going to have a navigation page and then you have just had to say that to which it has to navigate to. And you can provide a button and when you put that, uh, when you click on that button, it is going to load the next page. And you can see that it is actually going to push into a stack. And when you press the back key, it is going to pop from the stack. So that means it will revert back to the previous page. So the kind of behavior that you see in most applications like a master detail, like you have a list and then when you click on one of the items, it goes into a detail view and then it comes back. So the same functionality can be easily implemented using navigation page. If you want a flyout page, which is like uh, the standard uh, uh, flyout panel, which comes from the left hand side. Right? So you can actually use this flyout page with the uh, content for the flyout as well as for the detail. So here you can provide all the controls that you want. Likewise, you also have a tab page which will give you tabs on the top or on the bottom of the screen, which, which you can click and navigate to different pages. So all these different types of pages just wanted to give you a demo. Like you don't have to create anything from scratch. You just have to use one of these pages as required for your app and you will have that container. Now, once you have the page, the page is the first part as we have seen in this particular uh, Example, this content page. So this is your root element. So this can be a content page, a flyout page, or tab page, as we just saw, can be any one of these. Once you have the content page defined, the rest of your controls are all going to be embedded here. Now, you cannot put all your controls. Suppose you're having multiple images, labels, buttons, etc., to be displayed. Content page, unfortunately, it does not hold all of them. So you need a container to hold it, and that is where we use what we call a layout. So the page is going to be the first element. The layout is going to be the next element. So now what are the different kinds of layouts that are possible? You can have absolute layout where you can specify the location for each of these components. These are like absolute positions. They will not move. You also have a possibility to have a stack layout. And as I mentioned, you can have stack layouts which are either oriented, uh, vertical or horizontal. 
and whatever controls you put inside the stack layout will be stacked accordingly. If it is vertical, they are just going to be stacked vertically one below the other. So what I can do now is just copy this content stack layout. And it, now you can see the beauty of development using Maui. And uh, but I had stopped the application, but even if I had kept that application running, this is my main page and we already saw that it was running in the emulator. Let me keep it side by side. So this supports what we call the hot reloading, which means I don't have to necessarily stop and uh, run it every time. I can keep it side by side and say that, OK, I want to replace all these. OK, if I replace this button, it might give an error because there is a method. But anyway, let me give it a try. Let me just. So the application is actually running now. I'm just going to comment this part. I'm going to paste this new code that we just had. And you can see that it is going to instantly reflect on the emulator. So here I have declared a few labels. And you can see the output. So this label, the first label, I have given a light blue background color. And I mentioned the horizontal options to be start, which meant it stacked to the left hand side. Whereas the second label, I said horizontal option is center, so it is stacked on the center and so on. And because it's inside a stack layout, all these labels are orient, uh, stacked from the top vertically. So that was just a quick example to show how these layouts work. Now, just like the stack layout, you also have a grid. Grid allows you to define columns and rows and place all the content inside. So let me show you that uh, example now. So I can actually copy this grid layout and put it in the application here. So here I have four buttons and you can see here that the four buttons are place in the respective rows and columns. So you just have to specify the grid row and grid column for each of these buttons and they are going to be placed in the respective rows and columns. This is almost similar to how we do in HTML as well. And you can also have row span if you want to. Suppose if this button uh, 0, 1, which I have, I want it to be spanning across the two columns, then I can say grid dot row span equals to which will make it span across both the you can see that that is now spanning across both the rows. So that's your. Button which is spanning across both the rows. So that's how you actually create a user interface quickly in. XAML. Now in the interest of time, I will quickly move to some advanced uh, demos where you can actually see the power of XAML. Now, suppose I want to actually bind two controls. Uh, where I can adjust. One with the other. Let me copy this and let me give you a demo. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have. Two controls, one is a label which is just, just nothing but a text that uh, we will use. And uh, uh, I mean, that will just display some text like hello world or whatever. And then we have a slider. A slider is a control which allows you to adjust the values as well in runtime. Now, there is a error coming up because it needs to be compiled. I think when, it, when you're using data binding, I need to stop and run it again. Let me stop debugging and run it again. So this time, just for the sake of making this faster. OK, I'll use the emulator only because otherwise I'll have to keep switching the windows. So let's go back and say start debugging. OK, it has now given me an error because of the backend code behind file. It is not relevant anymore. So let me comment that as well. That is not required for us. So 
So XAML has this uh, wonderful concept called data binding, where you can actually bind controls, you can bind control to data and so on. So this is a very simple example to show you the concept of data binding in XAML. So here you can see that the label Hello World is displayed and there is a slider below that. Now if I adjust the slider, you can see that the text is automatically increased and I did not have to write any even handling code like each time when I, uh, the slider value changes, it need not have to check behind for a code behind file for an event and so on. Here itself, we are able to actually bind the two controls. And for that, we use this binding syntax. Uh, so there is a binding context that is available for all the controls. You just need to specify to what element it has to bind. And in this case, we just need to provide a name for this control. So its slider is called SLR. And you have to say that bind this to the slider called SLR. And that's the syntax we actually use within curly braces. And what is that property that we are trying to bind to? We want to try and bind this property called value. And that is what we are putting over here. Binding path is equal to value. So that is assigned to the font size. I could have also used that here. If I want to bind the text property, I could have done that as well. And I could have simply told binding to value. So path is a default, so I can also avoid writing that. But for this example, I'll just use that as well. So now you can see that when I move the slider, it not only change, uh, increases the size, but it also displays what is the current value of the slider. So this is a very powerful feature, and uh, you can actually expand this to bind with collections. So if you have some data in the backend, which you have collected from a web service, let's say you want to display a list of products, uh, for a shopping cart application or, or, or an e-commerce application. You just need to write the code in the backend to fetch the data from the API and that data you need to provide to the front end and using data binding, it will be magically displayed. So I have a simple example here to show uh, an actual application which uses a collection. So let me do that before we close today's session. So what I'll do is I'll create a few classes here. So one is that I'm going to create a class called contact. So this is for is, uh, defining the object or, or the class that I'll be using for this application. So this is going to just display the names and uh, details of a few people. So I have some code with me, which I'll use here. So the contact class is going to have just three properties. It has a name, mobile number, and image URL. And we, in this code behind file, I'm going to create a collection here. So we have a constructor. So I'm going to define a collection here and say, I want a collection to be created. So this is again simple C sharp. Uh, yeah, just going to create a list of uh, contacts. So contact is our class, and we are just going to create a list of that. Now, giving me some error here was. I think count is not required, I'll delete it. And this is okay. It has got an accessibility issue because of the default type which is used here, just internal. Let's say public. That problem should be solved. Maybe there is, oh yeah, there is another curly braces which is missing. Public main page starts over here, and then we have a public list.
I don't know some error here because of the formatting. Let me just copy this entire thing. So we have a main page. I'm just going to take it in the interest of time. I'll just copy the entire code here. Yeah, the contact list should be outside the main page. No, it's yeah, yeah, maybe. listed. Correct, correct. I understood. Yeah. yeah. So. OK, so we have a contacts view which has to be defined here. So back to my main code. And here instead of this, I'm going to have a different code here. So now what I want to show here is a concept called a data template. So. In the UI, we are going to create a collection view. A collection view is a special control which will help us to display the uh, collection. And a collection view does not know how to render the content. It is just a placeholder. So it is like a fill in the blank. But you have to tell exactly how it has to be displayed. And for that, you will provide a template. So within that collection view, you can define what we call an item template and say each item has to be displayed using this data template. So in short, data template say tells how that particular data has to be displayed. So in this data template, we are defining a grid and all we are saying is in that grid i want two columns so when you have 100 comma uh, a star it means that use 100 pixels for the first column and whatever is left you use for the second column so star is like auto automatic proportioning auto sizing rows in the same way i'm saying divide them equally so two rows and two columns and within this we are going to place an image as a placeholder and two labels as placeholders which will actually display the data for us. Now the properties that we have actually used in the contact class are image URL, name and mobile number. So all we have to do is use this binding syntax here and that is going to display the data for each of these uh, contacts. So let me just copy this as well here. And you can see the error has gone. Now only thing to be left uh, that I have to do is I have to provide some images. So in the interest of time, I'll just take some stock images that I have. And I'm just going to put that in the resources section under images. So here I just need to paste them. I can just uh, open this folder in File Explorer and I can place all the images there. And automatically this will be taken by the app when it is going to be executing. So with these changes, let's run this application and uh, see how it is getting rendered in the UI. My apologies, I think I have slightly exceeded the time limit for, for the no, session, that's but okay. I think yeah. yeah. We will conclude with this demo. And while it is building, let me also talk about the other uh, slides that I have here. So as I was already mentioning, these are the different types of pages which are available. These are different types of layouts which are available for us. And all these are the commonly used controls. So the controls used to present data, the controls used to initiate commands, to set values, to edit the text, to indicate activity, to display collections, they're all given here. So these are the common controls that we'll be using whenever we want to develop any application. And there are these links available for reference. Uh, there are a lot of sessions happening on .NET MUI, uh, MAUI these days. Uh, so there were a few, there was a session done uh, very recently, two weeks back. Uh, at Microsoft Bangalore. Uh, it was an in-person session um, with uh, along with uh, online streaming as well. Uh, so we will have a lot of activities, uh, I guess, in the coming months around uh, .NET Maui, uh, since it's a, a newly introduced platform and uh, there's a lot of interest in the community for this. And 
Uh, if you're interested, you can follow these uh, two Twitter handles, uh, James Montemagno and uh, Nish Anil, uh, who are both uh, program managers, senior program managers at Microsoft uh, and actively behind uh, the uh, development and promotion of uh, .NET MAUI. Uh, so you will get a lot of information and updates on uh, MAUI, .NET MAUI in these two handles. Plus, they have put together a lot of sample applications. There's a podcast application which is amazing, which uh, they have developed and uh, made available. The entire source code is available for us in GitHub to see. Apart from that, they also have lots of uh, other applications, tutorials, etc., uh, which you will find in their Twitter handles. All right, so now you can see that the application is running, and you can see here the names of all the people uh, that we actually wanted to display. They are all getting displayed. So. What I wanted to demonstrate in this uh, uh, particular example is how easily and quickly you can create applications which will run on all platforms. So the same application I could also run on a Windows uh, platform. Uh, I, I've just shown that on uh, Android. Uh, I could run it on my device straight away if I just connect it to my, uh, you know, my mobile to the USB port and uh, I can directly run it on my devices as well. So. With minimal effort, you can have an application running on all the platforms, whichever you want to target. So that is the best part of .NET MAUI. So that concludes my presentation, and uh, I think uh, we can take the questions now, if you have any. Thank you, Shivraj. Wonderful session. Uh, within a short time, you have covered so much ground. You introduced uh, the basic concepts, and then you showed uh, led us through the code and explained the code in detail. So it was, I think, a very uh, complete session in that sense. One question which comes to my mind is, suppose I already have an app in Xamarin Forms. How, quick, how easily can I migrate it to .NET MAUI? Or is there any advantage migrating that app to .NET MAUI? Okay. So well, thanks uh, for the feedback, and uh, this is a very good question. In fact, uh, Xamarin, the main difference between Xamarin and .NET MAUI, if you ask me from my experience, what I can immediately point out that in case of Xamarin, the solution had multiple projects, whereas here you might have noticed it is a single project. Right. So if you develop a, uh, an application using Xamarin Forms, you will have multiple projects, one, one project for Android, one, pro one for iOS and so on. Whereas in case of .NET MAUI, it is a single project. So they have made it much more easier and simpler. So uh, there is no possibility to directly uh, port that Xamarin Forms application over here. There are certain steps to be followed. I don't have the steps uh, that link handy, but there are certain steps that you have to follow with which you can easily migrate a Xamarin Forms app to .NET MAUI as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. But most of the code you will be able to reuse. It's mm. just that the UI layer has certain differences. Now with the .NET MAUI API, you may have to uh, look for the equivalent uh, element or the component that we use in the XAML and you may have to make minor changes. But the code behind file, the functionality is the logic, the business logic, which, uh, which will remain the same in both cases. Now about XAML, uh, can I say that somebody who is coming from a web developer uh, background, who know, who's more familiar with CSS, they can easily pick up XAML because I see similar uh, uh, yes, yes. Kind of Anybody language. can learn XAML easily. Yeah, yeah. Even uh, a margin. beginner. Correct. Even a beginner can learn XAML even easier than CSS because this is straightforward, right? Along with the components name, you are just going to provide the different properties. So, and it is quite intuitive. I mean, you can keep the uh, app running, and as you change, you can see the live uh, display. Uh, you know, because of the hot reload function that you have. You can see that uh, getting rendered in real time, and uh, it's much more easier, I would say, compared to CSS. Right. Yeah. Any questions from others? So, how do you see it uh, performing against Flutter in the market? Because there is a lot of talk about Flutter as well. Correct. 
So frankly, I have not uh, done any detailed study to compare between these two. But from my personal experience, I would say that for me, working with Flutter was a completely uh, new learning uh, involved because I had to learn Dart. I had to learn how to use the Flutter API, etc. Which is, uh, since I come from a .NET background, uh, I had to undergo that entire learning curve. But here in case of .NET Maui, it was like pretty straightforward. I did not have to even waste a single day in learning something new. It was very easy for me to pick up, uh, you know, and develop an app with, with uh, you know, very small amount of time. So from a development perspective, I would say the experience has been better for me uh, in terms of uh, the tool, in terms of the language, in terms of the features which are available in XAML, etc. This is much more faster and uh, easier for me, my personal experience. But yes, on the market side, .NET Maui itself is new. So we'll have to wait and see how uh, it is being adopted and uh, you know if any experts conduct any detailed study or any detailed research on the comparative performances, then I think we will get to know. And what about the Visual Studio that you are using? Is it a community edition or do we need to go for the paid one? No, no, this is a community edition which I'm using for learning and for small companies, including startups. Uh, I think uh, for uh, startups, they will have to check the Visual Studio documentation, but I know that up to a certain number of employees, if the startup is not employing or is not having a, uh, you know, is, is of a small size and uh, uh, they can actually use the community edition for free. So it is all provided in the licensing terms. So there is no right. cost involved at all in doing this. And uh, maybe final question. Suppose, uh, I mean, not suppose I am very new to .NET and C Sharp. So what would be the path towards uh, learning Mo uh, .NET MOI? Should I learn .NET first or C Sharp first and then move to okay. .NET MOI? That's a, yeah, that's a great question and it will be very helpful for uh, people who will be watching this recording later. So if uh, you go to the .NET uh, website on uh, Microsoft's website, if you go to the .NET uh, uh, you know, uh, portal, you will find a lot of tutorials which Microsoft uh, you know, experts have provided, which will help you learn C Sharp in a breeze. So I think there are like uh, courses for absolute beginners. Uh, I think in maybe uh, because it all depends on the amount of practice that you do, but I think the entire video list can we you can actually easily go through within less than a week. Also do some practice. So learning C sharp and getting started uh, on application development, anybody can do within a week's time. And you don't have to learn everything about C sharp. You don't have to learn everything about .NET because what .NET Maui gives you is only what is required at this stage. So. Uh, you can focus on XAML, create the user interfaces, and uh, depending on the type of application that you are developing, then it is all rest is all exploration. You'll have to identify the classes which are available for that. So if your app is required to send an email, you'll have to find out what is that class which is responsible for that. Create an instance of it, try out the methods, and then it will work. And uh, there are like a lot of reference examples that Microsoft has provided. Now, in addition to all these things, uh, what I would like to answer is that what I would like to mention is that Visual Studio is an amazing ID for those who have not used it. It has a feature called IntelliSense. So even if you're entirely new, as you code, it will automatically prompt like autocomplete, which comes in your Gmail, right? It will automatically yeah. prompt to like, you know, what are the properties and methods that you may want to use? So that is an amazing feature for a beginner. So while you develop itself, you learn a lot of things. So right. in short, what I would say is that the there is no entry. I mean, the entry barrier, entry barrier is very low here. Anybody can easily get started, provided they have an understanding of uh, object-oriented programming fundamentals, like basics of what is a class and object and so on, which is a very elementary uh, thing or a very fundamental thing in many of the programming courses. And if they have some background of C programming, then I think C sharp anybody should be able to easily pick up in a week, week's time, or maybe even less than that. And uh, you know can develop applications quite fast. Okay, okay, thanks for that. So, any other questions from Ralph and Sandeep or comments? Uh, I'm completely newbie in this one, so uh, I enjoy. I don't have any questions right now. <laughs> can you repeat Thank that? You. Yeah, okay. 
means i am a newbie i don't have much experience on that but um, i enjoyed this session the way he connected the phone and uh, used it is it exa- is it uh, directly on the phone like uh, screen what uh, this is it? i have connected my phone also but the one that i demonstrated was on the emulator but okay i could have done it on the phone also but i wanted to show the emulator because uh that that is a very interesting feature what visual studio provides right even if you don't own a phone or don't want to use your phone for that you can still do it with the emulator okay. so it's a package but, uh, what would be the minimum requirement of ram to run all this on the same system okay so i am using an 8 gb ram uh, machine okay. and uh, okay. with an i5 processor so visual studio 2022 has a certain requirements which are documented So as per the requirement, uh, it, they have suggested only 8 GB RAM. 